That's fantastic. Well, hey, I tell you, today's a little bit different, as you can tell. Um, our service this morning is being run by our under 30 crew. How cool is that? How about Susie on worship and that team? What a great job. Also in the morning, we have a full crew here setting up every Sunday morning. It's almost a whole other church service going on. And this morning we had um, the Twitchells lead our whole um, uh, ministry team meeting. And Jonathan Buckner he did a phenomenal devotional time with us. There's like 50 plus people on Sunday mornings here setting up. We have a small little church going on here just to make way for you guys to come and to enjoy what we do here as a, as a church body. So uh, we're going to continue our theme today um, with our young adults kind of dominating today. And I want to introduce our next speaker here. And just to give you a little background on Mr. Josh Wyant, he came to us about a year ago or s roughly, um, fresh out of seminary, um, got married here to one of our, um, our, um, our resident locals here, Taryn and, and the whole Stark family. And so, um, but he's been faithful to minister. He's been faithful in our, our midweeks, um, what we call our 21 degrees young adult ministry, teaching faithfully every week and serving there and pouring into our 20 and 30 somethings. And so, you know, my job as the executive pastor of the church is I'm always looking for people to um, have a platform to use their giftedness. That's just what we do here. We're, we're, this isn't a one pastor, two pastor show here. Uh, we are looking to broaden our base here so our church can be fed properly and served properly. And so um, Josh is just one of those guys that's been faithful in the trenches. And so it is my pleasure to uh, welcome Josh up to deliver the goods today. Um, he's going to be talking on the Great Commission. So would you give him a welcome, a warm applause, and show him some love. There are a lot of you out there. <laughs> Man. So we're, uh, we're looking at the Great Commission today. Does anybody know where the Great Commission is found in your Bible? Matthew 28. It's, it's on the sheet. That makes it a little bit easier. <laughs> Matthew 28. We're going to Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Um, if you need a Bible, our ushers have Bibles. I see somebody with some Bibles. Um, just signal them. Contact them somehow, make eye contact, whatever you need to do. We've got Bibles. We want to give those to you so that you can stick with us uh, as we're going through this, this great commission here. So I'll give you a second. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but... Some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to come here, to, to gather together as the church, to gather together as your body. We thank you for the, the opportunity we have to, to be worshiping together as one, to be able to praise you, to be able to seek you here and support one another, Lord. We ask that your spirit would be amongst us, that your spirit would be working in each of our hearts, that you would open our minds up to the words that you have for us, that you would just convict us of the things that you you know in our lives that we need to, to change, that we need to hand over and surrender to you, Lord. We just ask for your presence, that we might be able to see your face, that your words would, would really uh, speak true to us today, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Um, so a few months ago, I sat down with a friend to chat over lunch. He was asking me about how the young adult ministry was going here at Kumalani, and we got onto the subject of worship. Discipleship. <laughs> As we were talking, he said something that really made me think about just how important discipleship really is. He said this, imagine that you knew you were going to die soon. Let's say that you're even going to die in the next few hours. You have one last chance to say something to your wife, to your husband, to your kids, to your family, to your friends. 
what would you say? You'd probably tell them something very important, the, the most important thing that you could possibly think of. You'd, you'd want to leave them maybe with an important last request, or you'd want to share with them the most significant lesson that you learned about life during your time on earth. Whatever it is, you're going to tell them something that's going to be crucial for their lives going forth. Then we looked at the life of Jesus. In Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20, Jesus knows that he's on his way up to heaven. He knows that these are going to be the very last words he's going to be able to speak to his disciples. So don't you think that these last sentences of Jesus were probably the most important thing that he could think of? And the most important thing that Jesus could tell his disciples was that they need to go out and make more disciples. The, that message was not just meant for them. That message was also meant for us today. Jesus has called us to build his kingdom. And actually, that's putting it a little bit lightly. Jesus has commanded us to go out of this church building, to go out of our homes, to go out into our neighbors' lives so that we can share into their lives, so we can pour into them, so that we can connect with the community, so that we connect with the world and point them to Jesus. And that's what making disciples is all about, pointing people to Jesus. That's, that's all pretty simple, right? There's no response. Pretty simple? Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe not so much. It's, it could be a tough thing to do. This is the most important thing that we can do in our lives. But it's also one of the hardest things to do because it means that we have to be intentionally investing in the lives of other people. It means that we can't just be focused on ourselves and our own families. It means that we have to move outside of that bubble so that we can touch other people's lives. And that's not easy. In fact, that can be a terrifying thing that can scare us to death. But lucky for us, Jesus didn't just leave us hanging. He didn't just command us to go make disciples and then send us off on our merry way. He gave us a strategy. He gave us a guideline on how to do this. And today, I want to go through that strategy in the same way that Jesus did, and that is by answering questions. What I mean is that Jesus gave this command to the 11 disciples, and when he did, I think that he was anticipating the questions that they were going to ask him. And there were three big questions that he was thinking about. The first one, why should we make disciples? Number two, what do we have to do to make disciples? And number three, how are we going to be able to get such a difficult job done? Today, we're going to look into our passage, and we're going to find the answers to these questions. So, first question, why should we make disciples? Why should we do this? Why should we listen to Jesus here? If you're like me, you don't exactly like it when people tell you what to do, especially here on Maui, right? Because everyone in Maui is on vacation all the time. And when you're on vacation, you don't like it when people tell you what to do. You want to do your own thing. Right? You're all on vacation? <laughs> no, some of us aren't on vacation. Some of us live here. Some of us have to work, things like that. But, but even so, most of us don't like it when others tell us what to do. So when Jesus says, go make disciples, why should we listen to him? I'm going to answer that question with another question. When your parents told you what to do, why did you do it? I think that there are two main reasons that we obey our parents. The first one is that we trust that they want what's best for us. The second reason is that we, we respect our parents. If you truly are following Christ, the same thing is true. He definitely wants what's for best for us because he loves us like crazy. He gave up his life for us. The general rule of thumb is that if somebody gives up their life for you, they want what's best for you. We can all agree on that one. <laughs> so he wants what's best for us. But there's also the fact that we respect Jesus. And if we don't, we definitely should. Because as verse 18 says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That is some serious authority. In fact, that claim of having all authority is a claim of being God. Jesus is God. So when he's telling us to do something, it's not the same thing as your boss to tell you what to do on a daily basis while you're at work. It's a little bit different. This is God telling us what we need to do. 
as people who claim to follow God, we need to respect that command and actually do it. And by do it, I mean do it, not think about doing it. Are you, are you with me on that one? By, by do it, we need to do it, not think about it. Francis Chan is a pastor who's starting a church in the Bay Area. He likes to illustrate this point this way. He says, let's say that you have a teenage daughter. Some of you have teenage daughters. You know how this works. It could translate over to teenage son, whatever. Um, you tell her that she needs to go clean her room. This room is a disaster. It looks like an earthquake and a tornado like had a baby, and she let it loose in there and just tore everything up. <laughs> Something needs to be done about this situation. So you tell her to go, up, go clean her room. Well, she goes off. She comes back down. She's got a big smile on her face. This has got to be good news, right? Your kid comes back after you told them to go clean their room. They've got a smile on their face. They must have done something, right? This is good. She says, I thought a lot about what you said. I, I went so far. I memorized it. I memorized every word of what you said. I, I had all my friends over, and we all sat around in a circle, and we discussed what it would really look like to clean my room. But and we, we set in an action plan. We've got all these great ideas. It's amazing. Aren't you proud of me? It's easy for us to take Jesus' words as something to look at and think about rather than something to act on. So why should we make disciples? Because Jesus says to. Because God himself has told us to. He didn't tell us to think about what it might look like to make disciples. It's good to have a plan, but eventually that plan needs to be set into motion. In our passage, the disciples were really starting to grasp this idea. They were starting to catch on. They bowed down and they worshiped Jesus. Yeah, they definitely had some questions. The word here for doubt can also be translated as, as hesitate. They had hesitations. Who wouldn't? Jesus had just died but now he was alive with them again. The only conclusion that they could reach is that this must be God. We need to worship him. But it was still all so new to them that they were confused. We might have hesitations too. We might be hesitant to trust Jesus' authority and live out this command. But the question that we need to be asking is not, is it worth it for me to do this? But is Jesus worthy? Is Jesus worthy of your obedience? Is he worthy of listening to? Is he worthy of following completely? If the answer to that is yes, then respect his authority. The second question is, what exactly does Jesus want us to do here? How, how do we make disciples? How do we do this? <laughs> That's distracting. <laughs> um, uh, so how do we make disciples? The simple answer is that he wants us to point people to Jesus so that they can grow to be more like Jesus. That, that's really the heart of discipleship. If we were going to sum up discipleship in one succinct sentence, that would be it. And so let me say it again. Jesus wants us to point people to Jesus so that they can grow to be more like Jesus. You know how they say that the, the Sunday school answer is Jesus, right? For this question, the answer is definitely Jesus. We can stick true to that one. Um, but this is going to look different from person to person, depending on where the person is in life. If you're pointing someone to Jesus who knows absolutely nothing about Jesus, it's going to look very different than pointing our veteran pastor, Ricky Ryan, to Jesus. It's going to be different. As people grow in Christ, they have different needs. So let's look at how growth happens. And as we do, I'm going to compare the process to the growth of a plant. And I know that we've all heard way too many illustrations about how we're like plants, especially when we were tweens and we had pimples everywhere and hair growing everywhere. And our parents were telling us that one day you're going to grow up to be like a budding rose and you're going to be beautiful or whatever. <laughs> I get it, but, but stick with me on this because I think it will really help since we all understand plants and this is going to give us something very tangible to set our minds on. So, the first step of growth is planting the seed. This is Jesus' command to go. People cannot know about Jesus unless someone goes to tell them. When we go, we plant that seed in the person's heart. 
When we go, we're introducing them to Christ. And I know what some of you are thinking. Oh boy, he's going to tell us about how we should be spending time with strangers on the street trying to convert them. He's going to tell us about how we need to go with Pasha and Tiffany over to Kyrgyzstan to become missionaries. I don't want to do that. (laughs) Don't worry. That's not where I'm going with this. Hear me out. Going doesn't have to put you that far out of your comfort zone. Going for you might mean walking all the way across the street to your neighbor's house. It doesn't have to be that far. It could mean going all the way to Kyrgyzstan. That's part of going as well. But the point is, it's not about how far you go. It's about just going. It's about your actions on a daily basis. When you're at work, when you're with your family, when you're with your friends, when you're doing whatever it is that you're doing, are you considering how you can point people to Jesus? I have to clarify again, someone else out there is thinking, well, does that mean that we should be spending time with our friends just so we can convert them? I'm not very comfortable with that. I don't like that idea. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I'm right there with you. That's, that's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm saying is that our desire should be to see everyone know Christ. And a lot of times that's going to mean spending time with people to build a relationship where they can trust you and they're willing to listen to you talk about Christ maybe someday in the future. So in that case, going means spending time with people because you like them. They're your friend. But truly caring about a person means being concerned about their eternal fate. The topic of Jesus might not always be on the forefront of the conversation, but going means making sure that he's always on the horizon and you're looking for those opportunities to point them to Jesus. All right, our seed is planted. The next step of growth is going to be the sprout, and this is baptism. Baptism is basically the initiation into the church. When a person realizes that they can't beat sin on their own and they can't earn their way to God, the solution is to turn to Christ and accept him as Lord and Savior. He's the only one who can make us right with God. And when you choose Christ, you choose his church because the church is his body on earth. He's chosen to work through the church to build his family and to build his kingdom. And that's why baptism is so important. Baptism is a public declaration of an internal decision. Baptism tells the world that you've decided to follow Christ and you've chosen to surrender your life to him because you know that he first surrendered his life for you. So when Jesus calls us to baptize people, He's saying we need to push beyond just introducing them to Christ. We need to tend to that seed by providing it with an environment for growth. We need to bring them into the church. And by that, I don't mean that we need to bring them into the barn. The church is composed of the believers in Christ, those who are following Christ. So baptize means to bring people into the community of believers. It means introduce people to your Christian friends. Let them spend time in the community and fellowship of the church. Let them see the joy that you get from being a part of the church so that they are going to want to be a part of the church as well. Although, all of that means that we need to be spending time with the church, right? We should be in community with one another, doing life together and pointing each other to Christ. If you look at Acts 2, that's exactly what the early church did. They were meeting up with each other daily. They were hanging out. They were having dinner dinner together, just enjoying one another's company and sharing lives with each other. And in our context, they were probably surfing together. That's what doing life together means sometimes. Um, But when they were doing that in the early church, it says that God added to their number daily. One of the best ways that you can point people to Jesus is by being with other believers and introducing others into that community. So are you actively involved in the church? Do you live in a community like this? If you're not, it's really not a tough thing to do. For the young adults, we're meeting together as a community. Every Thursday night, we're hanging out, enjoying one another's company. We're studying the Bible. It's an awesome time. Um, Last week... We mentioned a little bit earlier that there were two uh, 
two groups that just started up that are going to be watching and discussing a series of videos called The Truth Project. That's a great way to get involved in a community like this. There are also tons of uh, midweek Bible studies that Jared mentioned. All that it takes for you to have a community like this is the desire to do it. So go, baptize. The third step is teach. Now that we have a sproutling, it's time for some serious growth and fruit. This is the command to teach. The words of Jesus are really our bread and butter. His teaching is nourishment for our souls. It brings growth in our lives. This step's pretty easy, though, right? Because all the teaching requires is that we make sure we get people, we, we trick them to come to Kumalani Chapel on a Sunday morning, and they, they, we make them listen to Ricky Ryan. And Ricky Ryan does all the teaching that we need. And if somebody needs you know, something to hold them over from Sunday to Sunday. We've got all these midweek Bible studies. We can just send them off to that, right? Wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Jesus doesn't say, drag your friend to a church service so he can hear the sermon once a week. Jesus says, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That means that you are supposed to be doing the teaching. You are a teacher. And I know that that might, idea might be intimidating, but it's true. You have an influence on other people's lives that you might not even be aware of. And since you're supposed to be doing the teaching, you probably should be prepared. It's important for each of us to be learning so that we know more about what Christ actually taught. So, in order to teach, we need to first know. And in order to know, we need to be intentionally seeking knowledge. The most important way that we can do this is by just getting into our Bibles daily. You can't expect to learn much about what Jesus has commanded. If you're only picking up the word a few times a week, maybe looking at a couple of verses, in order to really be able to teach others, you need to be completely rooted in the Bible. You need to be eager to get into it so you can really understand and grasp Jesus' words in life. You eat every day, right? Some of you don't. You should think about it doing that. <laughs> we, most of us eat every day. You wouldn't last long if you were only eating once a week. And the same is true for your spiritual life. You're not going to last long if you're relying on a Sunday sermon once a week. You need to be fed every day. But that's just the basics of teaching. Don't stop there. The key is to be sharpening your mind. Maybe you like to read. If you like to read, some of you probably do. If you like to read, there's all kinds of awesome books out there that are meant to help you understand Jesus' teachings. So get into a good book. One of my favorite things to do, I love to listen to sermons. Um, do you guys know what this is? Is that a smartphone? Wow. Smartphone, yeah. This is one of the fancy ones. I can, I can like throw this thing out of a helicopter onto a cliff, and it doesn't, doesn't hurt it. It's awesome. <laughs> If you've got a smartphone, you have very easy access to these things that we call podcasts. Uh, the younger generation, we understand this technology stuff. I'll have to explain it to your older folk. <laughs> but these, uh, these podcasts give us access to some of the, the best preachers and teachers out there. I think that podcasts might be one of my favorite inventions of all time. They're awesome. I, and if you've got a phone, you're always carrying your phone with you, right? So you can put a couple of podcasts on there, and you can be listening to the sermons anytime. It's really easy. That's what I do. It's awesome. So listen to some sermons. Get in the podcast. Or join one of those midweek Bible studies that I mentioned earlier. There's no better place to learn than alongside the community that you're doing life with. Or here's one last suggestion. Meet up with someone regularly so that you can learn from each other. Encourage one another in your faith. In 21 Degrees, which is what we call the young adult ministry here at Kumalani, we've been very intentional about doing this. We've started what we call joints. Let's get the laughter out. We know it's funny, joints. <laughs> but joints are our attempt to be intentional about discipleship. This is groups of two or three people meeting up once a week, 15, 20 minutes, maybe to an hour, not very long. It's an opportunity for us to encourage each other, to challenge each other in our faith, and to point one another to Jesus. 
The main idea of this is that however you do it, make sure that you are sharpening your mind. Be ready to teach people about Christ because you can't very easily point them to Jesus unless you know about Jesus. And those are going to be our three steps for growth. Go, baptize, and teach. I do want to say, before I move on to the last point, that we are not the ones who cause growth in people's lives. When we plant a seed, all that we can do is make sure that the conditions are right for growth. We can pick the weeds. We can make sure that we water it. We can point it towards the sun. But we do not actually cause the growth. And in the same way, God is the one who causes growth in people's lives. God is the one who brings people to spiritual maturity. Our primary job is to remove the obstacles as best we can. And most of the time, removing those obstacles is going to be as easy as pointing people to Jesus. The final question, how do we do this? How do we go about all of this? This is all really great stuff, but it's a lot to ask for. So how can we handle a task like this? You can handle it because Christ is with you. Christ is with you. Verse 20 says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is one of the most amazing things about Jesus. He didn't just take off and give us a bunch of orders, some checklist to complete before he comes back. He is actually with us now. He is living inside of us now through his Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> he hasn't abandoned us. He gives us strength. He pushes us on. He gives us motivation and encouragement. And that's how we can do this task. We don't just rely on our own strength. We surrender to Christ and we let him be the guide. We let him tell us when we need to bring him up in our conversations. We let him give us the words to say. We let him do the work. When we try to take control, that's, that's when it gets tough. That's when we start to make things messy because we just screw things up all the time. It's only when we surrender to Christ and stop trying so hard to do it on our own that he's going to really show us the way to be good disciple makers. You could say it this way. We can point people to Jesus best when we ourselves are pointed at Jesus. You can point people to Jesus best when we ourselves are pointed at Jesus. So be intentional about aligning yourself with him on a daily basis. And that's how you're going to succeed at this task. That's how you're going to be able to make disciples. At the beginning of this message, I asked you what you would say to your loved ones if you knew that you were going to die in a few hours. Jesus was not about to die here. Jesus had already died. He got that hard part out of the way. But he did know that he was going to be leaving this earth. And he wanted to make sure that his followers knew just how important they are in building the kingdom. Christ has chosen us to spread the gospel. He did the hard part for us by giving us the good news to spread. He surrendered his life for us. He took on himself the punishment that is rightly ours. And as he hung on that cross, he was more than happy to bear the suffering for us as he showed his obedience to the Father. Living this great commission out is tough. But just as Christ was obedient to the Father as he was nailed to that cross, so we need to follow in his steps and be obedient to what he's called us to do. A lot of you are already making disciples, which is awesome. And I hope that this message is an encouragement to you to keep on in your efforts, keep on doing what you're doing. Others of you probably have no idea how to apply all this. How do you actually get started in this process? It's a tricky thing. And to help answer that question, we thought it'd be helpful to give you a few different opinions. My knowledge is not as expansive as I hope it to be one day. So I don't know every way. So we went around and we asked a few people how they are pointing others to Jesus. And our hope is that this will give you some ideas of how you can be pointing people to Jesus, too. And with that, I'll hand it over to Kyle. Thirty years ago, I was a bartender on Front Street and coaching wrestling at Lahaina Luna. And I was, as a Christian, I was struggling with serving uh, drinks to customers and 
and uh, not having enough time to serve in the church because of my uh, responsibilities uh, and commitment to wrestling. But uh, my pastor at the time said, you know, I think uh, God has you right where he wants you. You're able to touch people's lives that nobody else can touch. Well, usually people ask why, you know, um, why don't you live your life like the rest of the world lives? You know, why don't you try to get more money or why don't you try, you know, to get a, you know, a good reputation? And that's where I'm, you know, I tell them that, you know, I believe in God and God is more than enough for me. I prayed on how to be able to share with the kids, with anyone really, because I would hear from pastors that we are to be disciples, that we're to share the word and share the message, but I had no idea how to do that. So I actually prayed and asked God to show me. And he actually did that this year through Sarah Twitchell, um, bringing in um, Kizzy E. That was such a fun and easy way for me to learn how to share the gospel and the kids love it. So I'm able to share it with the kids not only at the preschool but also here at Sunday school. Maybe at work when I'm cleaning with somebody I'll talk to them about the Lord, you know, or just talk about life. You know, the, the things we go through, talk about it and just, um, you know, let Jesus be the answer because He is. I find the most effective thing to do is to first of all talk about the Word of God. I'm sharing the principles of God and then when I do that I make sure I give Him the credit. I think God puts on my heart to really encourage people um, and to help them to know how important they are and how much they matter and how much God loves them and wants them to, you know, He wants to just be a part of their life. So one of the ways that I, that I feel like I'm gifted um, is really being able to uh, relate to and build relationships with, with, relationships with people. Uh, you know, so being a people person. Uh, I think that one of the areas that I use that, you know, to the glory of God um, recently, was joining an organization called Evangelism Explosion, um, where I was able to learn some tools how to um, share my faith and really better articulate what I believe in. Um, and I do that because I love Jesus and I want other people to love Jesus and be in heaven with me for the rest of eternity. I feel God's led me to the position I'm in now as the principal of an elementary school to just be that, if nothing else, to be an example to those around me. And when the opportunities arrive to, uh, to share about Jesus or through my role and through my example and through my testimony of my life, um, to show people who I am and what I believe and why I believe it. I think, again, kind of someone did the same thing for me once, you know, they were bold enough to <laughs> take me to the church and um, but also I just think you know who knows when a per person's time is you know to die and if I don't say it now like it might be you know the only chance for them. Thank you, Kyle, on, on making that video, putting that together for us. Hopefully, that gives you at least a, a few ideas, maybe some hints about how you can better point people to Jesus. Um, but we want to take it even a step further. We want to give you a very easy way to start putting this plan into motion. Um, one of the ways, 21 Degrees would love to offer you guys the opportunity to sign up for joints if you'd like. Um, Bobby Twitchell is going to be in the back. The, these joints, they're just something that we're very passionate about, uh, the, the young adults here at Kumalani. They give us a, a very intentional way of building disciples. It's just an easy way for us to meet up, hang out, talk about Jesus a little bit, point each other to Christ. And so we, we'd love to see others. If you're already doing uh, things like that, we'd love to hear from you because we're still, we're still working on making this even better for ourselves. So we'd love to hear from, from any feedback that you've got about your experiences. Um, we just love to see everybody meeting up with one another, pointing people to Jesus. Um, so talk to Bobby. Bobby's right there if you want any more information about joints. Um, we've also got a couple of other shine-up sheets. Um, if you feel like maybe you like those little junior high kids that get picked on all the time, you know, I, f I start to feel bad for them. Maybe you feel bad for them too. This is a great opportunity for you to get involved in the youth ministry. Those junior high kids need someone to, to encourage them, build them up. <laughs> and the high school as well. 
always looking for help and support. Rick of Villa is going to be in the back. Um, and if you feel like that might be a great way for you to be pointing the youth to Jesus, talk to him. Um, if you'd like to learn about how to share your faith with others more effectively, Sarah Twitchell is leading a ministry called Evangelism Explosion. You heard it mentioned on the video by Tamika and Annie. Um, Evangelism Explosion uh, gives you tools to share your faith effectively and, and easily. It helps you to be able to, to uh, think about your faith in a new way and, and really articulate it well. So Sarah Twitchell is going to be taking sign-up sheets if you'd like to participate in Evangelism Explosion. Um, I know what I'm asking is for commitment. I understand that. Joints are going to be the smallest commitment. Jo I mean, joints are 15 minutes a week. But it's a commitment, and I know we've all got a lot on our plates. Here's the thing, though. This message, it requires commitment. It requires action. Even if you don't sign up for anything at all, it won't offend me. That's okay. But I do ask that you don't let this message fall on deaf ears. Take these steps to the Great Commission seriously and, and put them in ask, action. Be asking yourself on a daily basis, how can I point people to Jesus today? Wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, how can I be intentional about pointing people to Jesus? With that, um, if I can have the prayer team come on up. We're going to transition into a time of prayer right now. Uh, maybe you've been listening to this message and you're not sure what to do with it because you're not really a disciple of Christ. You're, you're not following him, so this is all very confusing. There's no better time than the present to start. So the prayer team would love to talk to you about what it would mean to, to become a disciple of Christ. Maybe you were watching the video and you realized, you know, prayer is a really important foundation to lay as we're thinking about making disciples and pointing people to Jesus. Well, this is a perfect time to start laying that foundation. Or maybe you have something completely unrelated to anything that I've said here this morning that you need prayer for. Maybe there's a struggle that's going on in your life. Maybe there's uh, an addiction that's holding you down. There's something that you need freedom from. The prayer team is up here because what, how they point people to Jesus is by praying with you. And so let them help point you to Jesus. With that, let's all stand and I'll hand it over to Susie.